everybody, and welcome to episode 33 of All About African Violets. All About African Violets is musically sponsored by Ted Yoder. You can hear and purchase his wonderful music on his website at tedyoder.com. It is also available from iTunes. Hi, everybody. Come on into my living room this week. I decided I thought you might like to see the fire. <clears throat> it has been chilly here in Chicagoland. It's not as chilly um, as it had, you know, as the week before. And we didn't get the snow that you guys on the East Coast may have gotten. And for those of you who are in that, that area, the New England area, I sure hope that the digging out is not too tough. I know it's no fun to be inundated with like more than two feet of snow. That's a lot of snow. But I'm changing it up a little bit this week. Um, I wanted to to be in here just because I love my fire and I love my living room and I'm not always in here. But I'm also not using my iPad this week. I have a lot of things to share with you. So I'm gonna have my glasses on a whole lot today. Um, I had a, we're really gonna answer a lot of questions uh, again and um, from some experts, which is great. And I also have the second foot piece of the footage of the cleanup uh, and also there's a look on the stands. And so plenty to talk about. So let's go, um, let, me, let me address this first. I had more than one question um, this last week about, uh, in particular, one question, I think it was Sapphire Yin, who left a question about the fading of red backs and blossoms. And also uh, Gwen asked about her, her blossoms where one was so beautifully dark. Um, I printed this out, hope you guys can see it. She said it's just this really vibrant, deep color. And then the newer blossom, not so much. So I, my initial thought about both of these things was that it was likely a culture related temperature or light. Um, you know, maybe the plant like the, uh, for Sapphire Yin, they were new plantlets. Sometimes you have a little bit of growing pains, what I call growing pains. Um, often it happens for, for, for example, in a, varige uh, a variegated plant where it takes a little while for the variegation to come in. And I thought, well, maybe it could be that. Um, it could be temperature, you know, uh, maybe too warm, too cool, or or not necessarily uh, too warm or too, too too cool, but different temperature than maybe the plant was used to. This kind of harks back to what we I've mentioned to you before um, that I personally find that oftentimes plants that were hybridized and grown in an area that had a climate similar to mine, those seem to do the best for me um, in my conditions. So what I did was I wrote to Joyce, my expert, and I always ask her things, and, and I said, Joyce, I'm getting a lot of questions lately about plants fading, red backs not so red, and blossoms not the deep colors they used to be. There are some questions and photos, and, and I directed her then to the website, and, and I said, I'm thinking that it's likely growing conditions and temperature related, particularly for those grown in natural light. <clears throat> Excuse me, and it could just be growing pains, um, and then, you know, you know how the variegation sometimes takes more time to come fully in on young plantlets or, you know, just taking their time to get situated. And what she wrote back to me was, I think the key to the fading plants, and that would be um, the Gwen's fading plants, these ones. She said, I think the key to the fading plants is that she says she has low light. Lions, which is the hybridizer, lions grows their plants in a greenhouse, so the light is very bright. The plants were hybridized in this environment and have a high need for light. This is what I'm talking about. Plants that are often grown, you know, in conditions that are similar to mine. Um, and she says, when it is darker, the plant chemistry slows down and the pigmentation on the back of the leaves and in the flowers just doesn't develop normally. It may improve in the summer months if she is growing in window light, but if her conditions are stable year round, she may want to seek plants from hybridizers who grow under lights instead of in greenhouses. 
One more note, the plant shown is blooming true to type. It has not sported. This is a strictly cultural effect, and if conditions improve, meaning if it gets more light, the desired color will return. And then she said, we see this effect whenever we pack show plants to travel for several days to faraway shows. The buds that open en route to, sh to the show in a closed dark box will always have a lighter color than the flowers that were open before the box was closed. The flower pigment's chemical development must occur in the very last stages as the petals unfurl. And I thought that was very interesting. And then she sent me another email. And what she said was, um, she wrote to Dr. Jeff Smith. And you guys have heard me mention Dr. Smith before. He writes the column in search of new violets in the African Violet magazine. And he talks a lot about hybridizing and, uh, and different effects and how things work in, in that way. He is a scientist, much like Joyce is much more scientific than I am. So she says she sent me what she wrote to Dr. Smith, and Dr. Smith gave me permission to share all of this uh, email exchange with you guys. And she says, my friend Annie um, is doing a podcast series, blah, blah, blah. And she said she's getting some good questions. Yeah, you guys, you do great. She occasionally consults me for answers. And then she, um, she directed him to the website and said, basically, the grower is growing Alliance Hybrid, which she just got in January, in darker conditions and isn't getting the rich color that she expected. She then shared the information that she sent me. And, um, you know, and then she said, even though I responded to, to Dr. Smith, she said this, even though I responded to Annie, I don't know enough about when the chemistry of the pigment's development actually occurs. And while my anecdotal experience seems to indicate that light plays a key role, I don't know that to be true. What can you tell me? Is this true for the development of pigment in both the flower and the foliage? Thank you for any help you can give. So Dr. Jeff responded and said, Joyce, light can certainly play a role in the amount of pigment that is produced in a plant or flower. Your answer certainly makes sense to me, and I think it was a good response. However, I am wondering if this isn't more of a temperature effect than a light effect. I've seen some flowers respond strongly to different growing temperatures, producing some pigment when warm and a different shade when cool. For example, Frosted Whisper produced pure white flowers for me under warm growing conditions. Grow this plant on a cooler, lower shelf, and the flowers turn pinkish and become nearly solid pink. You mentioned the effect of greenhouse growing versus light stands for light, but there will also be temperature differences. I'm thinking that the difference in purple shades here is due to temperature. The trouble is, I'm not 100% sure if the new conditions are warmer or cooler than the greenhouse, greenhouse conditions were. They might evaluate the person, meaning Gwen, might evaluate the temperature the plant is currently in, warm or cool, and try moving to the opposite temperature to bring out the dark purple color. I'm thinking they may need to go colder, in this case, as warm or hot temperatures tend to bleach or fade colors. So isn't this interesting? I just think this is so fascinating, you guys, and I, I hope you're finding it as interesting as I did. So Joyce then responded back to Dr. Jeff Smith and said, we definitely see the effect of temperature on flower color. In Texas shows, you rarely see the dark colors that the Canadians have on the same cultivars. Similarly, we see less intensity here in blossom color for fall shows than we do for spring shows. But that would seem to indicate that cool temps would intensify color and warm would dilute them. In my mind, that intensity of color seems to be a different chemistry from what is happening when warm temperatures allow color to blush through on a white cultivar. That didn't seem to fit this circumstance since in my mind it was working opposite what would be predicted. Although to be fair, greenhouse temperatures can be so variable that it is hard to predict what the differences might be between the two situations. 
It is probably good, a good idea to mention that though, and Annie had already thought of that. So I think that um, in terms of these plants, I think it's clear that both, both Joyce and Dr. Jeff are feeling, you know, like it, it's a cultural, it's a cultural deal. And so, and I think it, it's the same way for the red-backed, uh, the red back leaves and petioles that Sapphire Yin was was seeing that the change in in those as the plant was was being repotted and growing on. So I think that it's best uh, to take a look at temperature, take a look at light, maybe make some changes or shifts in both of these areas and see how it goes. So you guys, I, I know that that was long, but I really want, and that's why I didn't have my iPad, because it's so hard to like hold it there and read. So I just printed this off for you. And the other thing I wanted to tell you guys is if you have questions about hybridizing or traits, you know, in terms of what, um, how does, you know, what traits be, are more uh, dominant or recessive, if you have any questions of that sort, please feel free to leave those for me on the website. Dr. Jeff has advised that he is happy to help with those kind of answers. And I will tell you also that he is extremely knowledgeable in African violet species plants. So if you've got any questions about those as well, I'm really thrilled that he's, he's offered to me that he would be happy for me to be able to consult him just like I asked Joyce about, um, about growing conditions and, and plant things as well. So that's kind of exciting. So let's move on to, oh, to tips and treasures here, but I do have one more, one more thing because last week Lori in Maine asked about the ethyl champion variety called Cabbage Patch wanting to know if it was a vintage variety, if it was considered vintage. And I did write to Joe Bruns, and the response that I received from him, he said, since it's not registered, it's difficult to say. It's not in the 1983, the old MVL from 1983, but Mrs. Champion was registering plants until 1987. She likely hybridized past 1987, so most likely the cultivar is at least 25 years old, but I would need to go through back copies of the MVL supplement to know for sure, and I don't have supplements that far back. So I'm sorry, Laurie, I don't have a definitive answer. It's, it's probably considered vintage, but there's no way to tell you that for sure. So you would just need to enter that, if you were going to show it, you would need to enter it in the class uh, that, you wouldn't enter it as a vintage violet. You would enter it in the class which it should be in based on its description. So I hope that helps. Well, let's move on to tips and treasures because I do have footage to show you today. But I did have a question from Anne on the website and she said, my violet question is that while you use wicks, you don't keep water in the reservoirs underneath as I've seen so many growers do. Whether over a grid, on a tray, or in each pot with its wick hanging down into an individual container that always has water. In fact, your stands obviously have those grids, but you choose to use individual plant saucers and then seem to only add the water to the saucer as needed. How is that different from just letting the pot soak up the moisture in a saucer without a wick? I'm confused. And how on earth do you successfully remove both leaves and blossoms with one hand while you hold the camera in the other? You make it look so easy while I have problems using two hands sometimes. Well, Anne, I, I do have a lot of practice, first of all, uh, and I am left-handed and, and the camera requires me to hold it in my, the way the camera is built. You know, they make cameras for right-handed people. They don't make them for left-handed people, at least not that I know of. So I'm holding the camera in my right hand and I am using my left hand, my dominant hand, when I am I'm taking blossoms off and, and pulling leaves. So I have a little bit of an advantage there because I'm left-handed. But your question about the wicking and why I do this the way I do, um, I choose not to community water, and I've touched on this, I think you're a newer viewer, I've touched on this in earlier episodes about watering and wicking. I use um, a modified Texas style of potting so that I do always use a wick. It makes it easier for me if I do go on vacation. I can put the plants on reservoirs. I usually put them on individual ones unless they're small, and then I'll put them on a shared, a shared reservoir. 
This is my choice as a grower. It's what I find works best for me. The reason I have egg crate on my shelves instead of just having the plants sitting in the trays is that it affords me more space on the shelf. I have um, my two main shelves that plant stands that I use are two by two. I have one two by four down in my basement, but I, I use these smaller shelves and uh, it gives me a little bit more space to have the plants sitting on the egg crate. And that's the reason I do that. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, let's, if, it's, if it doesn't, if you would like more, um, more info on that, please feel free, don't hesitate to leave me another question. Let's go take a look now at the second half of my cleanup footage. This is more about show plants and I'll see you on the other side. Hi you guys, I'm back and I've brought plants out now from the guest room and this is Blueberry Sprite. And I've got my note cards there. I like the way this shape looks, which means I have a lot of leaves to remove and you'll see what I mean. They are also, they're kind of growing down, so they are in the way. So we don't need them any longer. They've served their purpose. Now it's time to make sure it's not trying to bloom. It is trying to bloom. And I want to be very extra careful with the, this because I'm hoping to take this to show in Illinois. You'll remember this one went to show in Tulsa. And it's had all this time to kind of make a comeback from getting bumped around on the plane. And there's dirt. There we go. So I'm pleased with that one. Next I want to show you this one. This is the one that was so dirty. This is Optimara Ontario. And you guys, you know, I ran out of the paper that I usually use, the the newsprint with no newsprint on it. And anyway, I have to go get some. I get that at the U-Haul um, place. I'll go buy a box. Okay, this is a little immature leaf under here. It's kind of hanging there, not doing anything. So I'm going to take that one. And you might notice that I'm not saving any of these leaves. This one is an immature leaf. You can tell by the shape, how it never kind of grew all the way. I mean, it's a good sized leaf, but it's not necessary anymore and neither is this one. So we are left with that great triangle shape that the, everything is going to fill in. But this is the plant that was really dirty. So let's first, I'm going to, I'm brushing off the actual pot. There. Now, I'm supporting the leaves. They're resting on my, my thumb and my finger. And I'm going to just take all this, this perlite dirt bits and pieces off of here. I'm going to set this down. And this already looks a whole lot better. And it's trying to bloom. Ooh, dirt. So we don't want that. Let's get rid of that. I know I'm not in the center of the frame, but I'm, I'm trying to stay where the light is best for you guys to see. There we go. And I got a little bit of water on there because that plant had some water on it in the saucer. So I'm just going to gently blot that up so it doesn't water spot. And uh, oh, there's some more dirt. See it? Now, 
one of the things that's happening on this plant, and I don't know if you can see this at all, um, is there's a little bit of like a dot of white right there, uh, and it's in a couple of spots. And that is generally transpiration. And the way you can, you know, the plant breathes just like we do. When you've pulled a leaf off, you can use that stem and just gently touch it to the spot, and that will usually take care of it, believe it or not. Easy peasy. There's one more little spot right there. Sorry, I'm going to get my hand in the way. There we go. All right, another one ready, ready to keep growing. I'm running out of space in the kitchen. I brought a whole lot of stuff out here. Um, okay, let's take a look at this one. This is a uh, roulette. This is a chimera. And you'll, you'll remember a couple of weeks ago I said, I think there's some leaves that have to go. And there are. This one and this one. And it's dirty. And you learn, you have a very light hand with this. And now this plant does definitely have some of the white transpiration on it. Little spots from that. And so I'm going to just use the stem. Touch those. Right here. There we go. And it is also trying to bloom. Stop it. There we go. All right. Now, as I'm looking at this, I'm kind of feeling like maybe. Nope. I'm going to have to let this one fill in and see how it does before I take anything else off. Did you see that? Look again. I was thinking, oh, maybe that should go, and maybe this should go. But if I do that, then I have a big old gap right there. And uh, I, I don't think that's ideal. So maybe it's that one. Oh, now that's looking a little better, a little more triangular. We take that one and this one. Okay, another one ready to go. More transpiration there. And sometimes these little transpiration spots come back. So if you're going to show and you see them right at entries, go ahead and, and dab them at that point. All right, walk out of the frame. Now, here's a trailer. Let's take a look at a trailer. This is Rob's Wagga Wagga, and this always makes Tammy laugh. Every time she says she hears me say Wagga Wagga, she laughs. Now it's trying to bloom, so I am going to remove that. And we've got a good number of crowns here, so I think things are going well. In that respect, I don't see. I see a couple of leaves that can go. This one, a trailer. You want to try to have all the crowns be blooming at about the same size of leaf. So some of these are a little smaller, uh, and I'm I'm getting rid of them. But I think that's all I'm going to take. Let me think. To take this one. It's a little too big. And this one, it's a little twisty. Okay, uh, and again, it's dirty. And let me tell you that if your eyesight is, is starting to get to where you need to wear cheaters, reading glasses, please put them on when you're working with your plants. It is so easy 
to miss very small bits of dirt, but let me tell you that the judges will not miss them. So you really want, you really kind of got to be scrupulous. There's another blossom stalk in there, which you guys can't see. This one's ready. All righty. Okay, here's another standard. And quite frankly, this one I think looks pretty good. And I, it's, this is Optimara, Michigan. And except for the fact that it is trying to bloom. One more right here. Now this does have a couple of marred leaves. This one has a little bit of a mar on it. As, uh, and this one has a little bit of transpiration. But I'm going to leave this one alone. There, this, is, this is something that you want to think about as, you, as you're growing plants, particularly as you grow for show. Um, and you make your choices about what leaves to remove, what things to change up. This is uh, maybe a half a point. But if I were to take this leaf away, I would have at least a three point gap in the symmetry of this plant. So I'm gonna let it go, uh, keep growing with the marred leaf and um, rather than remove it. Well, I could take those two. Yep, let's take those. There we go. This one's ready to keep growing. Now I've got, okay, this is an interesting one. This is, I think it's Smooch Me. This is Smooch Me, one of my very favorite plants. And it's growing. It's got a little funky looking leaf here. And once again, I can choose to, I, I am going to take these off and maybe this plant is not gonna to go to Illinois. I think this one, maybe if, if I take these leaves, it, I might have to wait for it to go to, um, to national. Because I'm gonna take quite a few. I know you're going, ah, what are you doing? All right, but I've taken it down to where now all the leaves are in good shape and it should grow well. This was the really kind of wonky leaf. That it, it's a really funny shape that I took off. I hope that was helpful for you. I hope, I hope you could see the shape particularly of, um, of the first plant that I worked on. It's one that I, I, this blueberry sprite, I took it to Tulsa, as you guys will remember. It, it made it through the, the tumbling of the plants in the x-ray machine on the way. And I, I wasn't sure initially that I was going to keep it. And it, I'm liking it a whole lot. And I'm very hopeful that it will either go to Illinois or go to National this year. And uh, I hope you could see the big change uh, when I took the leaves off. It really helps it look shapelier. And it looks a lot better. So um, it's time now to take a look at what's on the stands. And there's something sad this time on the stands, so I'm, I'm feeling a little embarrassed. You guys will see it. I'll see you, I'll see you in just a moment. Hi, you guys. Time for a little look at what's on the stands, and this is the top shelf. You'll see there are only a few plants up here right now. I am still making some final decisions. I have shifted quite a few down to this shelf. Um, these are plants that likely, um, they need more time wherever they're gonna go. The top shelf I think for right now uh, is, those are Illinois hopefuls, so I'm crossing my fingers. And I might move Western Moon up, we'll see. But uh, this is everybody else. Everyone else is looking pretty good. I'm just not sure they're gonna be big enough as standards to go to show this year. We'll see. Let's go take a look uh, down in the basement. Well, hi, you guys. We're in the basement. 
I still need to check on that plant, the one that I have the name of Ma's Old Fashioned. I need to send an email. And over here, you can see Lion's Fireworks. So this is looking good over here. Things are looking just fine. And you can see that we've got one come, trying to bloom over here. Um, it's a, it's a John's. I think it comes from Scandinavia. I'm a little concerned about it. It's supposed to be a white blossom, and right now it's looking kind of pink to me. Down here, you'll see that I did not get anything done this weekend with uh, EK Princessa Gretza. I didn't, I had a very, very busy week here, and uh, you can see over there that I did not get any repotting done either of those babies. But before we go take a look at them, let's take a look at the baby shelf. Yes, that really is all the Smith, uh, Smithiantha cinnabarina plants. I, I thought about maybe not showing you this, but then, you know what? That's not how I roll. It's really important that you guys know that people make mistakes. I had never grown a Smithiantha before, and Dr. Bill Price did tell me to not let them dry out. Well, I was not down here in the basement a lot this week, and these guys dried out and they really dried out. I tried watering them to see if they would make a comeback, but as you can see, they have not. So I, my first foray into growing the, a Smithiantha, not so good. Kind of embarrassing, but there it is. I'll know better next time. Here's my little Apicia. It's still kind of hanging in there doing its thing. It's got a little plant starting, uh, a sucker starting at the, on, on its neck there. And for Apicias, that's okay. Go give you a quick look at the uh, little plantlets and uh, I'll be right back. Here is the tray with all the babies in it that I did not get to pot up this week. Of, or last weekend, it has just been a crazy, a crazy week. You know, and this is uh, this is a kind of important, I think, also that you know I have more plants right now than are than is optimum for me. I really uh, I do my best at around fifty varieties, and I have far more than that right now, as you guys know. So, and certainly um, I won't I will be divesting as we go along, but it's a little challenging for me to keep up with all of it right now. Here's a quick look at Pink Pussycat. I did take some leaves off of it. Forgive the my dirty potting bench. I apologize. It looks gross. But this plant definitely, um, it's definitely, sorry, I got it out of the frame. It's definitely crooked, uh, even with the leaves I took off. The symmetry on this plant has never been ideal. That's one of the things, I mean, I've kept it around, um, and it's probably a good thing. I think this will probably go to national um, if it if it shapes up a little better and, and gets a good head of bloom on it. We'll see. Let's go upstairs to the sunroom. Guys, a little short stop on the way. I'm in the kitchen. Here's my Petrocosmia carii. It is on a, on a reservoir, as I think you can see there. Again, some lower leaves starting to, to fade away here. I... I, th I just think that's how it grows. I'm really not sure. Um, it's still trying to bloom underneath the leaves. I don't know if you can see that under there. Uh, I think it may be still getting a little too much light. So I'm going to continue experimenting with it and shifting it and moving it around. And here's the Gisneriad shelf in the sunroom. And can you see how beautiful these colors look? The the beautiful bright yellow of the Columnia Apollo and the red orange of the Columnia Firebird and the beautiful purpley, it looks very blue um, on camera, but it's it's definitely purple um, of the moonlit velvet streptocarpus. I just love seeing all these these three bright colors when I walk in here every day. And everybody else down there looking good. And up here, a couple people did not get watered well this week. I thought I got all these uh, plants watered, but there's a couple that are a little sorry looking, so I'm going to have, uh, I need to get that taken care of. Now, over here, let's move right over here. Hope you can see this. This is Grape Glory, and I let it come into bloom. It's a new plant to me. This plant is um, 
It was chosen for next year's Helen Rhodes plant for the Illinois State Show. That's a special class. Um, every year we have one and it's chosen two years uh, previous by the show chair. So last year's show chair chose this variety for next year's show. It is blooming true. It's a, a semi-double-double uh, with a purple with a lavender, uh, a lavender fantasy and a white edge. So I'm kind of excited about that. I will, uh, I, I may let it bloom a little bit longer, but then uh, this will be disbudded for show for next year. Let's go take a look at the big box violet. Well, here is the beautiful big box violet. You know, this has just been such a beautiful plant. I've, I've so enjoyed having it here and, and working with it in, in throughout these months. Now, this plant uh, is ready to be repotted. I know I've been saying that I need to take leaves off of it, but I have not done that. And it's been almost six months. In a couple of weeks, it will be six months since we potted this up and started our experiment with it. And I have never repotted um, one of a violet in a self-watering pot. So I think that will be uh, the next step of this little experiment. But that's the look at what's on the stands this week. I'll be right back. How, how, how red is my face? I don't think it's just the warmth from the fire. <laughs> I I'm embarrassed, you know, but I've never grown a smithiantha before and I was warned to not let it dry out, but I thought that that was, I thought, I guess I thought he meant just in the initial stages when I was trying to grow it, um, but I think they're pretty dead. I know they're, uh, they're a, rhiz a rhizome, the plant is a rhizome, maybe, um, maybe I could save the rhizome, but I also know that it wasn't the that plant really was not the deep deep cinnamon color that I have seen um, Smithiantha cinnabarina grow as, and so I, I suppose I could be a little more sad than I am about this. But I also think it's important for you guys to see that people make errors, even experienced growers make mistakes. As you know, I mean, the whole podcast started because I made a mistake and lost all my plants. So I, I will know better the next time I, I grow one of these and uh, we'll keep moving forward. But before we do that, it's time to get the bail money ready. So um, uh, as I have said for the last few weeks, remember that the AVSA National Convention information is on the AVSA website now and uh, it's there and you can take a look. And it, I am now um, eight weeks out from show from the Illinois show, it's in eight weeks, I can't believe it. And the what it says this week in Pauline Bartholomew's Growing to Show in the pre-show schedule is increased light time by one hour, disbud doubles and lightly variegated varieties for the last time, continue to disbud semi-double stars and singles, check for suckers, continue bloom booster, and foliar, foliar feed once more, and she does say that that is optional. I choose, I think you guys know that I choose not to foliar feed. Um, I, I've never had a, an issue with it, um, not, not doing it. So, well, it's time to keep moving forward. Thank you so much for joining me this week. I, I really appreciate all of the ratings and reviews that you guys have left on iTunes. If you are downloading the podcast from iTunes and watching it there, and you haven't left a review or a rating, uh, if you have time to do that, I'd love for you to do it. It makes the podcast more visible for people who might be trying to find it and uh, look for something, a, a podcast about African violets and indoor gardening. So thank you for joining me. I hope you've enjoyed being in the living room. We'll be back in the sunroom next week. And I hope that your days are filled with all the things you love. Good growing. I'll see you next time.